When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died my riches gain I count but loss and poor content on all my pride
every head bowed and every eye closed. How grateful we are, O oh Lord, for the cross. For it was at the cross where we first saw the light and the burdens of our hearts rolled away. Thank you for the witness and the work of the cross, for its cleansing power and its sustaining presence that reminds us of your undying love toward us. Hide me now behind the cross so the words might be heard might be the words of a living Lord. These things we ask in his name and for his sake. Amen. Welcome to the virtual worship of First Baptist Church West on this Sunday. And thank you so much for joining in and being a part of our virtual congregation. I want to thank our music ministry and staff for blessing us in such a wonderful, wonderful way. Well, there's a word today that I want to lift that is found in the Gospel of John. We've been camping out in the Gospel of John during this Lenten season. And I want to invite your attention to chapter 19, one simple verse that seized my attention all week that I have not been able to get away from. 19 verse 1 says this, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. I want to preach for a while today as God shall guide from this subject. He did it for us. He did it for us. There may be no scene in human history that impacts the emotions the way the crucifixion of Jesus Christ affects us. You see, the crucifixion was not a single act, but a series of actions that led to Calvary and death on the cross. But it all started when Pilate took him and had him flogged. He took him and laid claim to his humanity and to his life. He took him and put Jesus under his control to determine his fate as well as the methods to how it would be accomplished. He took him. Now, Pilate is the first to take such actions upon Jesus, but he will not be the last. When we ponder what Pilate did, it tells us several things. When he took Jesus, Pilate was demonstrating his authority over the one who held all authority. When you think about it, Pilate was bold enough to lay his hands upon God because he thought that God could be controlled. He took him because he believed that God's will could be bent to our purposes. And there are those who think that the only nation entitled to the blessings of God are the land in which we live. There are those who think that their political party has the corner on the market of what God believes to be right. There are those who constantly look for ways to use religion as a tool to assist them toward some other end because they think that God's will could be bent to their own. So Pilate took him. He took him to prove to others where power over the masses reside. If Pilate can lay his hands on the miracle worker that healed the sick and fed the hungry, it proved that no one was out of his reach or beyond his authority to do whatever he willed. Pilate took him and had him flogged. Flogging was a particular kind of beating perfected by the Romans. A person was handed over to the soldiers to be flogged, was beaten with a leather whip that had bone and metal sewed into the tip to exact as much pain as possible. The standard for flogging was 39 lashes, the typical number, and with each lash, the whip cut open human flesh and ripped away an exposed muscle. It was not uncommon 
for persons to die from the beating and not even live long enough to be put on a cross. In the case of Jesus, his flogging involved more than just the whip of the lash and included the mocking and the beating by the soldiers. When Pilate took him, he gave permission to the soldiers to do whatever they desired to Jesus. When Pilate took him, Jesus was stripped of all rights as a member of the community. There are no protections to keep him from unnecessary abuse. When Pilate took him, there is no innocent project to look into his case. There is no court to appeal to. There is no smart lawyer who could use how Pilate lived in his private life as a reason for the case to be dismissed or to have the case tried by someone else other than Pilate based upon what Pilate did in his private life. When Pilate took him, they told the masses his power was absolute and he was free to do with Jesus whatever he liked, including allowing the soldiers to mock him and beat him. Now the beating that Jesus endured by the soldiers surely must have made him almost unrecognizable by blow after blow that came from trained soldiers. The men who beat Jesus knew how to inflict pain. And for hours, Jesus suffered under their mockings and beating all because Pilate took him. Then when we, we continue to read the chapter, John tells us th this. They took him and led him away to Calvary to be crucified. That they are the soldiers who came and take control of Jesus and lead him to the final place of death. They, they, they took him and they made him carry the instrument of his death upon his own shoulders as they marched through the city toward Calvary. In, in the same way that John Brown, after his capture from his failed raid on Harper's Ferry, was made to sit on the coffin he would be buried in as he rode to the gallows. Jesus makes the journey to Calvary, carrying the cross. And, and, and once the soldiers arrive at Calvary and complete their work of placing their victims on the cross and waiting for them to die, they sat down and they gambled over the meager possessions of Jesus. You see, they not only took him, but they also took all that he possessed as well. The personal property of a male Jew without property or occupation would consist of five articles of clothing. That's it. Five simple articles of clothing. A headdress, an outer garment, a pair of shoes, a girdle to girt himself with, and an inner tunic. The possessions of the condemned became property of the death squad to help compensate them for their service. So after they took him, they took his possessions and they sit at the foot of a cross and gambled over his possessions. None of his family members would be able to receive something of his belongings to remind them of him. I have a pair of cufflinks in my possession that belong to my dad. And each time I put them on, I am reminded of him and I feel some sense of closeness to him simply by having something that belonged to him. The family and friends of Jesus have no such thing to look forward to because they not only took him, they took his possessions. None of his friends would be able to hold and remember him through the things that, that they possessed that could remind them of better days. They took his garments and they cast lots for them, making a game out of the things that mattered to Jesus and mattered to the people who loved him. Now, it is, it is unfortunate how we are so quickly willing to play chance with things that never were intended to be gambled with. 
those who use our local streets as sites for car racing gamble with their lives and the lives of others. Those who refuse to listen to public health officials about the threats to community health gamble the well-being of the community. And those who do not make the most of their educational opportunities gamble with their futures. And I'm disappointed with all the needs in our state when our lawmakers made the priority was to bring sports gambling to our state. There are some things that you ought not gamble with. The soldiers took him, took his possessions as well. And all of these actions were signs of their power and signs of how helpless their victim was. The witness of such brute force chills the soul. The witness of such lack of concern and compassion makes us wonder how one human being can be so cruel to another. They took him and they led him away to be crucified at Calvary. Yet, in the midst of this horrible scene, and those taking and doing whatever they desired, there is something else happening that is unseen to the human eyes. Jesus is taking more than just the abuse and punishment of Pilate and the Roman soldiers. Jesus is taking more than the rejection of the religious leaders and an ill-informed crowd. Jesus is taking our sins and nailing them to the cross so that the charges against us might be dismissed. Jesus is taking our sins upon himself and becoming sin so that we might be called the sons and daughters of God. Jesus is taking the guilt that belonged to us and he is making it his own so that we might be ransomed and that we might be pardoned. Jesus took the judgment that was upon us and canceled it by the shedding of his own blood. Isaiah had it right hundreds of years before the events when he looked into the future and declared he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we're healed. Jesus took our despair and our disappointment and our doubts and told us that we could trust him. We could trust him to love us even when we were unlovable. We could trust him to prepare a place for us to live through eternity with him. That we could trust him to wipe every tear away, to mend every broken heart, to ease every troubled mind. That we could trust him because they took him. And when they took him, it ensured that all of my sins and all of your sins, and all of my guilt, and all of your guilt, and all of the punishment and judgment that was coming my way and coming your way, he took it because he paid it all. This is our hope and our trust that we indeed have a burden bearer and that he has taken away all of our sins in every claim that was on us. And that is news and reason enough to celebrate. They took him, but he took it. He took it all away, all to Jesus, because Jesus paid it all. Let's pray. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There were a lot of things, Jesus, that you took that day. You took the blows of soldiers, the rejection of the crowd, the judgment of Pilate, the nails in your hands and your feet the spear in your side. There were a lot of things that you took that day. But the thing that you took most 
was our sins away. For indeed, you are the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. They may have taken you, but you took it. And thank you for taking it all away. Now honor your word today. May it not return into your void. May it serve the purpose that you desire and design. That the glory might be yours. These things we ask in the name of our living Lord and for his sake. Amen. Well, my friends, thank you so much for joining us today in our virtual worship here at First Baptist Church West. Trust, pray, and hope that you were inspired, challenged, and encouraged, and that you might never forget the lessons of the cross and just how far God was willing to go to demonstrate his undying love toward you. All of these actions took place so that you might know that you can trust him, that he loves you, and he has your best interests at heart. I hope, trust, and pray that if you've not made a decision to follow Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that you will ask him to come into your heart today and thank him for taking all of your sins away. If you make that decision, please write me at rwoodsfbcwest.org or call me 704-372-1075. I'd love to hear from you. I would love to pray with you and love to encourage you more in the coming days. We're quickly making our way to the Easter season, and whereas we're grateful for our virtual audience, I want to encourage each and every one of you to find a church that you can attend in-person worship on Easter Sunday and know the fellowship of other saints that are marching up the King's Highway. Thank you again so much for being a part of our virtual congregation. Know that we love you and cherish you. Have a great and wonderful week, and I look forward to sharing with you again next week at First Baptist Church West. Have a great week.